afternoon or good evening, depend <clears throat> depending on where you're logging in from. Welcome to the Land Dialogue webinar series, which is organized in partnership with the Ford Foundation, the Land Portal Foundation, the Tenure Facility, and the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Thank you for joining us. My name is Thin, and I'm a journalist specializing in food systems and climate change, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's session on climate funding and COP28, turning pledges into action. Now, the idea behind en, sur la consommation des engagements en action. awareness on the land rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. Now, these rights, we believe, are a prerequisite to achieve national and international goals around forest governance, food security, climate mitigation, economic development, and human rights. Now, this is our fourth and final land dialogue for this year. But first, before we start our, our discussion, I'm just going to go through some housekeeping rules. Now, this webinar is mainly going to be conducted in English, Portuguese, and Spanish, but we also have simultaneous translations in French, as well as the other languages that I just mentioned. To access the translation, all you have to do is go to the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom window, click on it, and select the language that you want. Now, this webinar is going to be 60 minutes. We've set aside about 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A box and not the chat box. But do use the chat box, as I see others are already using, to introduce yourselves. Also, feel free to tweet using the hashtag Land Dialogues, which is just one word, Land Dialogues. And you can also follow the live tweeting from the Land Portal and Tenure Facility Twitter accounts. And finally, we are also recording today's session and we will share the link with you later. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's turn to today's topic. Now, the past two UN climate summits have been big on promises for indigenous peoples. At COP26 in 2021, governments and private philanthropies pledged nearly $2 billion for indigenous peoples and local communities to fight deforestation. And last year, at COP27, there was a creation of a new loss and damage fund to help vulnerable communities respond to the climate disasters. Leaders are again preparing for another round of climate talks at COP28, which is going to start later this week in Dubai. And this time, they're vowing to enhance the participation and visibility of Indigenous peoples during the negotiations. But as we all know, having the funds or just being able to participate is not enough. The funds need to reach, need to reach the right people and at scale. But is that happening? And if not, then why is that not happening? Can the newly established Indigenous-led funds lead the way forward? Well, we have a fantastic group of speakers who are going to answer these questions. And in the interest of fairness, I am going to introduce them in alphabetical order. So first, we have Casey Box, who is the Director of Global Strategy at the Christensen Fund. Now, Casey is committed to supporting Indigenous rights, participatory grant making, and grassroots network building. We also have Deborah Sanchez from the Hondura Miskito Group, uh, who is a longtime indigenous leader, and she recently took on the role of director with Community Land Rights and Conservation Finance Initiative, or Clarify for short. We also have Jenny Lopez, who is a land governance advisor responsible for land tenure rights programming and policy work at the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And we have Valeria Paye from the Tirio and Castellana people of the Parque do Tumucumaque indigenous land in the states of Para and Amapa in Brazil. Valeria, I am so sorry if I mispronounced those names. Um, now, Valeria is the head of the executive board of the Podali, which is an indigenous fund of the Brazilian Amazon. And last, but definitely not the least, we have Josimara Meguerio, who is from the Bare people, and she is the coordinator of the Rio Indigenous Fund. This is an initiative um, from a federation that actually represents 23 indigenous peoples living in the Rio Negro in the Amazonas. So it's great to have this group of donors as well as indigenous leaders present to have this discussion. So I think the first question I would like to ask to all of our speakers is to sort of reflect a little bit 
back on the discussion that we had last year um, on the donor promises to indigenous communities. Um, can we perhaps talk about where, you know, whether those promises have been fulfilled? So I'd like to ask our speakers to sort of briefly talk about perhaps one key win as well as one major challenge or obstacle um, that have you know emerged since last year's um, climate summit. Deborah, perhaps I can start with you uh, for the discussion. Yes, thank you, Teen, for for um for the opportunity, and I I want to reflect on that. Uh, we probably have already reached like this key milestone where. Uh, we all have a common understanding of the importance of the flexible that the funds needs to be, like a fewer administrative hurdles, and then um, how we need to be in the center of the design of, of these funds. So now we're talking about effective participation, flexibility, and how that can look like and how can we implement. So I think that we are going from that phase to the implementation phase. And, and where we moving towards that, I, I think that one of the very important uh, key issues is that we are being reimagining the funding ecosystem, right? We are being creating like these led funds by by indigenous peoples, local community, Afro descendant peoples, and and how we govern these funds and how we put these funds together and how we start moving forward and working with with them, and, and the most important thing is for me that we are creating actual um, lesson learns. We are creating experiences we are uh, doing it and, and then that will bring us a lot of the knowledge that we need uh, to move forward but of course uh in the obstacles we we are facing that is um is hard to to really uh, implement and and recreate things where the system is already set up right so we really need to start looking at the more systematic approach and how we can make flexibility how we can actually demonstrate on the ground and we've seen that um the tendency that a lot of the philanthropies are moving a lot faster on that on that part on that um way but then we still seen a lot of the people from the from the the bilaterals that also um working on that and looking at yeah. how we can have effective participation and how we the flexibility can look like from so for, from our side i think um we've been like working hard in, in, in developing these funds. And now we have established in global level funds, regional funds, national funds, and that are working. So I think this is a, the greatest um, a, a approach or, or takeaway that I can have from, from our site. Thank you so much, Deborah. That's actually very encouraging to hear. Uh, Valeria and Josimara, can I ask you to also briefly talk about one key win and, and, and a challenge? Valeria, could I? Uh, perhaps start with you and then we'll go to Josie Mara. Great. Good morning, everyone. It's in the it's the morning here in Brazil. We are in Manaus in the Brazilian Amazon region. We're participating here with you, chatting to you. It's good to do that. About the question. So what could be a, a key win, an achievement? For us, the opportunities to be at COP, taking part in the processes, sometimes not directly, but, but some of our leaders are, uh, to introduce ourselves, to speak for ourselves, to be there at a space to a big public, to a big audience, this is an opportunity to disseminate, to have a broader dialogue. So we see that as an important step and as a challenge to be met. So we still need to build the process that seems to me to be a long road of building trust because the funders must trust, in fact, with uh, trust the instruments that we created that we manage and this means that in our perception that this support also isn't arriving in the volume that uh, should be arriving by now 
So we still are taking, um, you know, we are still in the talking phase and not in the acting phase. So that's the first uh, message uh, we would share to reflect on the process so far. Great. Hello. Uh, Hola. I agree with what Valeria has just said. Uh, my position is very similar. I think something positive that I can say is precisely this opening. So these occupations that we indigenous peoples are carrying out in these spaces of discussion, of dialogue, international spaces particularly. So this process of, of being listened to is very important to us, it's very positive in recent years, particularly since the last COP going forward to the 28th. So that process of just listening is very important to us in and of itself. And it's something that I, something negative, but not negative, but a challenge is that we need to receive more practical support, not just in speech, not just rhetorical. So a true partnership and also to establish this process of building trust of partnership. I think that's the, the initial message I would like to leave with you. Great, thank you so much. Casey and Jenny, I'm coming to you. You've heard from the indigenous you know, groups and leaders. Oh, what, what about you? What would you reflect on? Casey, can I start with you first? Sure, thank you, Then I think last year I spoke to Toya from Kobayab about the issue of capacity building being on the indigenous people's side. And the good thing is, is that indigenous peoples have definitely addressed that. You have the leadership of Pudali under Valeria as now executing grants, receiving more funding and more complex funding. You have Deborah Sanchez now leading Clarify here on the call today. Indigenous peoples across Asia have, fo have founded the Indigenous Peoples of Asia Solidarity Fund that will distribute small grants all across Asia. The first ever women's forum in the Congo Basin has called for the first ever Indigenous and local community led fund for the Congo Basin. And finally, Shandia convened uh, stakeholders at the OECD in Paris to talk about better tracking accountability and transparency when it comes to funding for Indigenous peoples. The challenge, unfortunately, still exists on the donor side. We know that in 2021, only 7% of that pledge out of Glasgow went directly to Indigenous peoples and local communities. And when we dig deeper into those numbers, I'm concerned that it's even less than 7%. So but really, the challenge still exists on the donor side. And there's more that needs to be done to create more flexible funding. And we need to allow indigenous peoples and local communities to define themselves what they view as direct funding and financing. Thanks, Casey. Um, that's, a, that's a striking number. Jenny, um, I'd like to come to you for your thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, and I agree with all the comments that have been said. Um, I think the thing I, I, I'm feeling optimistic though, that some progress is being made. I mean, from what I've seen over the, the last three years, really since we launched that, the pledge in Glasgow is I have seen progress being made. I think that, I mean, what we're, we're showing is more IP and LC led organizations are being directly funded than we've ever seen before. Um, I really believe it's not just about the 1.7 billion, it's not just about the money in itself, um, it's about how we're working together as donors, as IP and LC organisations, other partners, civil society organisations, and we've seen a level of dialogue and collaboration and discussions between all of those stakeholders um, in ways we that really had not happened before. It's been really exciting um, in, in modern Montreal, in New York, at COPS, to have leaders from government alongside the stage, alongside discussions, alongside events, with IPNLC leaders, um, with civil society organisations, in a way that was not happening before, to really have visibility of this issue area by prime ministers, by presidents on stage in a way, again, we had not seen before. Um, I mean, particularly in New York last month, to have, you know, the ministers from Norway alongside ministers from Brazil, which we didn't even have that minister for IPLC before. I mean, I, I do see this visibility that the pledge has brought, which again has brought attention to this and now means there's an accountability commitment from donors, which again, we did not have before on this issue. So I, I do see positive change, but I really do agree with other comments that it is slow. It is a journey, but at least we are on that journey now together. And there is that accountability and commitment, which again, 
three years ago was not there. So I would like to say I agree it's slow, but I am really feeling positive that at least we're having this conversation. Great. Thank you, Jenny. I mean, what I'm hearing from from everybody, I think, is 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 it's a it's optimism, right? And 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 I guess. Um, the fact that it is happening, the fact that there are openings that didn't exist before, but of course, there's always room for improvement, right? But like you said, you know, we are at least on that road now. And the question now, it, it, it's there's no question anymore about whether, you know, the IPLCs need funding and that there should be funds. It is now about, okay, how do we make sure that, you know, we can fund them at scale and and, and that well targeted. Um, Deborah, can I just come back to you again? I mean, Casey did a very um, quick but super useful rundown of, you know, multiple Indigenous led funds that have started appearing. Um, could you just give a brief overview um, in, in addition to what Casey have said and, and whether there are any other uh, funds um, that, you know, <clears throat> that, 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 have, that have come up that, that are, you know, really interesting and exciting. Um, thank you. I, I will say that we've been seeing like a, a, this system of global, regional and national uh, financial mechanism that is being um, built, led and governed by indigenous peoples, local community and, and Afro descendants. And, and I think there, there is a few of them and we can see, for example, at the global level, we are talking about the, the community land rights and conservation finance initiative that is being incubated on in um, rights and, and resource initiative coalition and with the technical support of Campaign for Nature. And, and basically uh, what we're saying is we are this global mechanism and we are giving grants in all lands and territories. And, and we are having, for example, grants up to 1 million. And then we have this fiscal sponsor uh, mandate also, two grants uh, that are over uh, 50 million. So we are seeing like a scaling up, right? Uh, this issue of capacity, this issue of how we scale funds uh, uh, that goes to to the ground and then we have the the regional and national funds i can i can i mean valeria uh, my my sister here can tell talk more about podali and how it's governed how it's led but we see in pawanka we we see in the ipas the solidarity fund for the asia we see the mesoamerica territorial fund nusantara fund also aman has a national funds uh, already and for example we've been collaborating with the man's national funds and with the mesoamerican territorial funds and clarify is um, giving grants to them so they can actually build their capacity for example in, in Indonesia with a man these grants will go to um, strengthen the capacity of some of the chapters of some of the members of the organization, the communities that are part of the man network and then uh, in the Mesoamerican we'll go approximately to 15 projects and, and the call for proposal was already launched and, and finished this month and they will go for example across five six countries and, and will go from territorial governance to conservation to community entrepreneurship so we are seeing that um, this collaboration and these funds and this this system that we are building this network of funds um, led by indigenous peoples and local communities, we are actually working together, we are complementing, we are supporting each other to get that skill to bring that funds directly to the ground. Great, uh, Deborah, thank you so much. Um, could I just also ask the audience, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A box and not the chat box. I see a lot of comments coming in and we just want to make sure that, you know, we could get to your questions. So please, uh, use the Q&A box. Um, Deborah, my question, I was going to have a follow-up question around, you know, what can be done to make sure that the funds complement each other, but you did actually just now already sort of answer that question on what you're doing to, 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 to make sure <clears throat> that there's, you know, that there's complementarity. Um, and I just actually wanted to ask um, perhaps to Valeria and Josimara whether they have any thoughts or anything they want to talk about on this particular aspect as well to make sure that you know all these funds sort of work well together and and, and collaborate and complement each other uh, obrigada, Deborah. thank you Deborah, for this uh, link 
to be able to talk a little bit about this process ourselves. This construction of the network at global level, we're part, our organizations are part of a broad alliance, of a large scale alliance, which is represented by our organizations. Deborah mentioned some of them, AMPB in Brazil, APIB, COIAB, in Congo, as Casey said, in the Congo Basin, Hepeleac, in Indonesia, Aman, the other partners. So we are here in a big block mobilizing and building mechanisms. Our processes are the result of debates of our movement of our organizations. So the Podali Fund in Brazil is the result of a discussion of more than 10 years, led by Coyab, like Josimara, who is next to me, the fund, her local fund in the state of Amazonas, the process is the result of a discussion that the Federation of Indigenous Organizations has been having. So we, share with you really a process of construction of the network from the ground up the example of the local fund to a regional fund which is the podali fund and to the macro fund at global level the ampb fund so a concrete example of how we are organizing ourselves and building these alliances. So I want to share with you also, beyond the indigenous network, we are talking about the indigenous network more broadly, globally, but in Brazil, we are building and strengthening the network of funds led by social movements, not just indigenous people, but other relatives of ours traditional peoples, quilombolas, peasant communities, so many social movements. Of course, there are many stories to tell. We can continue later. Thank you. I would just like to mention uh, that uh, all that's been said, we can notice that there's a global movement of funds, organizations, at national at global scale with the same objective which is to save this planet to save our peoples to make this world better um, as our sister said in the beginning so there is progress however slow yes there is progress and we need more and more to strengthen all this network Great, thank you very much. Obrigado. Um, Casey and Jenny, um, the next question I have is for both of you, you know, from, from the donor perspective. <clears throat> of course, like you said, you know, the good news is that, you know, the funds are there now and, and the money is being dispersed. But, you know, Casey, as you yourself mentioned, you know, how they're being spent and targeted still needs to be improved. Um, so what do you think needs to be done to change this, to speed this up? Um, Jenny, maybe I can start with you this time. Thank you. I and mean, I think this is really at the heart of what we're trying to work on as donors with other stakeholders is trying to understand what are the most effective ways of getting that funding dispersed first of all, more quickly, and then second of all, in a way that, you know, we can really build a more effective longer term mechanism. So I think what we're what we're realizing and Casey, <laughs> and I hope you'll, you'll also agree is there's ways we need to be working perhaps with intermediaries and trusted partners um, to make sure that that can happen at a at, a, at scale more quickly, um, which means that IP and LC led organizations can really receive that money, even if not directly, more directly in a, in a way they can have influence and control over, but building towards actually being able to absorb that directly at scale 
over over those years. Um, I know there's different views on whether you know what we're talking about as capacity building is really fair because obviously that's asking IPNLC led organisations to adapt to donor requirements to some extent. Um, and I think we're also you know accepting that for some donors, in particularly bilateral donors, there'll always be some red lines in terms of reporting and accountability that unfortunately we won't be able to shift so understanding where those red lines are but I think what we are looking to do and I'll speak as a bilateral donor is trying to dig deeper as to where there are also the the yellow lines where can we shift where can we adapt as donors and again that will be a progression but at least we can we can actually start to understand that better and see how we can work more effectively. So I think there's also recognition that given we have this collaboration now between philanthropic and bilateral donors, where can we actually collaborate together to understand those opportunities for philanthropic organisations to fund things at different stages to bilateral donors? And there's also work that bilaterals will be funding that perhaps philanthropic organisations may, may not. So I think we're also you know, realising that as governments, we also fund some of the broader systemic reform. We also support work for, for um, government capacity building. How can that better complement some of the support directly to IPLCs to be an enabling structure? So I think it's really understanding how we can better have that collaboration, coordination, but also challenge ourselves, particularly where donors have those restrictions to actually put in place, um, I guess, other, other mechanisms, even if it may be working through trusted intermediaries and partners to actually make sure that that's as effective as it can be. So I think it's the shorter, more immediate wins, but making sure that's part of um, a more structured journey towards actually change at a greater scale. Thanks, Jenny. Casey, what are your thoughts? Um, do you do you have do you agree with Jenny? Do you have anything that you want to add? Feel free to disagree, Casey. <laughs> as well, it is a dialogue. You know, as donors, we come from different angles. So feel feel free to disagree, Casey. No, I completely agree with Jenny. I think there's completely a lot of room for private public partnership. At the same time, I think going into COP twenty eight. Unfortunately, I still think that some donors don't think that by supporting indigenous peoples directly, we can achieve climate and biodiversity targets at scale. And I respectfully disagree on all fronts on that regard, because we've been using the statistic for a long time that indigenous peoples are four to five percent of the world's population, and they've been protecting 80 percent of the world's biodiversity. So they've already done it at scale. Now it's the time for donors to really um, comprehend and understand that direct financing will only help to contribute to achieving those targets. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. Um, Valeria and Josemara, can I come back to you again, right, because both of you are leading um, Indigenous funds for the <clears throat> Amazon. What do you think um, we need to be doing practically to get funds where they are most needed. Um, and also, you know, very briefly, if you could tell us what the next steps are in terms of, you know, the funds that you're leading. Um, again, Valeria, uh, perhaps I could start with you. I think that Josimara is going to answer to your question first, sorry. No problem. Well, thank you very much, Finn. Thank you, uh, Casey, for your kind words. Let me tell you something. I think that we need to be recognized as a financial efficient mechanism able to work that has also a technical role to play, but at the same time, a political role to play in our territories, right? We need to know that we are working together with our movements. So we, in a very specific manner, we worked uh, hand in hand with the indigenous movement, together with the people in the field, with our communities, with our people. And this is very important to uh, know. And that's important and vital in our process. Thus, we need to be stronger. As uh, Casey mentioned, I do agree with this idea. All this support must be direct support without intermediaries. All the research and the assessments must be done. How these existing funds are working 
and how we are evolving together. Therefore, we will be able to get stronger and stronger all along the trust process and direct dialogue with the funders. Donors must be able to listen to us. They must look for us, not before the intermediaries, right? When before giving funds and giving support, please count on us first uh, of all. And then the future steps, well, in a nutshell, I think that the moment has arrived to consolidate the existing funds with all the instruments, with the toolbox that we have, that are already set in a proper manner in order to reach all the indigenous territories as much as possible, the whole Brazil. And this alliance that has been mentioned by Valeria at the beginning must get stronger. All the ecosystem needs to get stronger and stronger. We are indigenous people. We are working all together at a bigger scale. Thank you. Maybe just a, a quick note with regards to this final comment. Once again, we must talk about what we need to do on a practical basis for things to happen. Beyond being present and getting introduced to the main stakeholders, to all the representatives, which is important for the Podali Fund, and also uh, we must uh, make things easier, and we believe in Podali Fund, we need to have a better dialogue to introduce ourselves and also to give tips and hints amongst funders and donors in order to better build these uh, trust processes from the funders' side for these resources to get on the field and to reach uh, our uh, purposes. And they must believe that they belong to our projects as well. They are involved in these very important processes that we are living all together in all our territories and all the resources that are getting in reality, they are reaching to our territories, maybe in different ways, in different manners. I think that we have uh, different processes to make things happen and to face uh, these uh, challenges in reality. Well, we are always talking about a pivotal issue that we always try to answer how all the resources will reach to our hands and how we will be respect in indigenous people, local and traditional communities such as the Quilombolas and many others without disturbing and without uh, questioning the rules as a global uh, principle that we usually we see uh, such as a limitation to access once we have loads of rules and red tape. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to reach to the resources, right? Great. Thank you so much uh, for that, both Valeria and Chusimara. Um, Jenny, uh, did you want to sort of just uh, 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 give a brief um, example as yeah. to why sometimes direct funding, bilateral direct funding is, is you know, can be a challenge? Thank you. Thank you very much, then. Um, I just wanted to illustrate perhaps where it's not even always a matter of trust or, or gatekeeping. Sometimes it's purely what we would call, you know, efficiency or effectiveness and value for money, which to fund any program um, for overseas development aid and taxpayer money we have to respect is say we had, for the sake of argument, 50 million that we could give to um, IPNLC organizations and support them. If we were to fund every single one of those organizations directly, that would then place reporting administrative requirements, which would mean it would really not be possible. We would never get the approval to have to work directly with every single one of those, let's say, 25, 50 organizations we could fund, that would require such a large team on a really practical basis to work directly with every single one of those organizations. It would mean we could not fund, we could only fund a very, very small handful. Whereas let's say we work through an intermediary who could manage that, let's say 50 million fund for us, that would mean we can work with a much larger number of organizations and that um, that intermediary could absorb a lot of the risk, the accountability and the reporting commitments, which would mean that that intermediary could work in a way with those organizations, which really is suits those organizations much better. You would be able to develop those 
um, reporting requirements in a way that actually suits you as an organization. Whereas if you're reporting to us, the requirements for administration reporting would be so high, it would mean that realistically, um, it, it's not, it would not work on a practical level. So sometimes it's purely a matter of being able to work more effectively and through an intermediary, it would mean that we're able to support IPA, IP and LC organizations and, and the intermediary, if it's a trusted partner, which is really able, someone that we can ensure is working with IP and LC organizations very directly, it really just means that it's able to get that funding to IPLCs more directly, but in a way that removes a lot of that um, that burden. So sometimes I would argue it's a very practical way of just meaning we can support IP and LC organizations in a way that otherwise our requirements mean we can't because of the risk, because of the reporting and purely because the number of staff that we would require, unfortunately, it would just not be practically possible. So I would just also ask people to come back to let's how do we make practical solutions work? It's not always just about the trust side. Great, thank you for adding that, Jenny. I appreciate that. Um, I can see that we already have quite a lot of questions coming through. So I'm going to go through the final round of questions now. I mean, it's been a really interesting conversation and, and you know, I could, I could continue asking so many questions, but let's go to the final round. And Deborah, can I start with you again? I'd like all the speakers to actually very briefly, although slowly, so that our translators can do their job, um, talk about what do you think we need to achieve at COP28 based on the discussion that we have just had? Um, Deborah? Yes, um, thank you. I, I want to um, to have a few reaction also um, to the Jenny's and, and Casey's comment. Um, we know that this has been um, these red flags for, for the bilateral cooperation. And, and I think that's what why Indigenous peoples, local community as unresponding with led funds right we, so we are creating these big structure infrastructure funds that would also make the enabling conditions that we can reach more people and we can do it at scale so i think um the thing about intermediary is that issue where indigenous peoples and local communities are actually the decision makers of the processes so we need to really think that in, in a very fine uh, way. So the effective participation is the most important part of every system that, that we can put. So we can actually say that we are doing this um, direct funding to indigenous peoples, even if through several mechanisms, right? Um, so for for us, as Clarify, we, we've been uh, demonstrated progress. So we have 52 active projects. We have 23 in the pipeline. We're supporting a lot of things from advocacy, tenure, security, conservation, organizational capacity, but it's not enough. And you see a lot of the questions in the chat is about how we do get grants, how my organization can access to fund uh, to the ground. So is there is still a lot of demands that funding gap is huge as as um is Casey mentioned at the very beginning. So I think that we've been demonstrating uh the redirect iterate commitment of to the goals of the pledges have demonstrated that there is a under common understanding and that we are going to move forward. But now we need to ensure that indigenous peoples, local community, and Afro descendants are heard, understood, and respect and that we are actually in the center of the decision-making process for, for all the initiatives that are coming. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Casey, can I um, go to you next? And then we'll go to Jenny. And then um, just Valeria and Josemar, I, I think you had a bit of a connection issue just now. We're just asking the final round of questions before we go to Q&A, asking what do we need to achieve at COP28? Um, Casey. Yeah, I think there's three things that we need to achieve at COP28. One has been said loud and clear on this call that we need to let indigenous peoples and local communities define what direct financing means for them, whether it be through an intermediary or not. I do understand the case of governments, it's much more complex. And I think Jenny is a shining example of someone who's really trying to think differently when it comes to funding indigenous peoples and local communities. 
The second thing is we need to make sure that the just and tra just transition is just and that it respects the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. I think we're seeing the forced eviction of indigenous peoples in particular places in the name of achieving uh, the world's most pressing climate goals. And I don't think the eviction of peoples needs to happen in order to do that. And then I think finally, indigenous peoples needed to be included very deeply and meaningfully in the loss and damage discussion. Great, thank you. And thanks for yeah mentioning the loss and damage as well. Um, it's, it's, it's a tricky issue, isn't it? Everybody seems interested in it, but then nobody <clears throat> seems to be really sure of what the parameters are. Jenny. Um, I think it is critical to maintain the visibility and to maintain that dialogue. And I think we will certainly already be having that at COP. I'd also like to flag that the next donor annual report will be published at COP. Um, if you haven't read the last one, please do look online. Land Portal actually hosts our web page. So please do take a look. And at COP, you will see the latest, um, I guess, figures, but also the latest narrative from donors on what we've been doing. And of course, I would encourage everybody to challenge, to critique us, but also to do that with the practical, constructive um, ideas of where you would like to see that moving forward now that we're halfway through the pledge. Um, so yes, I think the critical things are visibility, ongoing constructive challenge, and using that platform and those opportunities. Great. Um, Josimara and Valeria, your thoughts on what to achieve at COP28 before we open up for Q&A? Desculpa, é, o nosso... So sorry, because we are having issues, uh, connectivity issues. Well, you know that we must share with you everything that is happening in the Brazilian Amazonia and how to get access to technology. You know that we have our limitations and we are experiencing these limitations here live. This is a part of the process of these improvements that we need as well. Well, it is a shame that we couldn't follow all your dialogues and opinions for a while, but let's see, what do we need? What we must reach? through this uh, discussion and debate during COP28? Well, I think that the messages that you all shared are very important with this regard. And what will be the future steps? I do believe that we must place ourselves. We need to introduce and to showcase ourselves. We need to be always constantly working for the future processes. We are on a constant basis opening the spaces, occupying these spaces at different levels and stages. I think that this belongs to these uh, processes that we are building as well. But on the other hand, let me tell you that it's vital and very important. And I'd like to invite you all, uh, if you will be uh, during COP28, and also if you come to visit us in Brazil and Amazonia, I want you to know our experiences to visit the initiatives that are getting the support and we are contributing for for you to better understand our reality in our uh, Amazonia rainforest and for you to be aware about all the processes to better know our people to better know our initiatives that have been amazing and everything has been uh, possible thanks to all your support as well and also to carry on believing in the process giving uh, the support that we really need to get stronger through all the mechanisms this is the final and closing remarks that i wanted to share with you thank you so much well in order to complete a little bit Valeria's words, I think that in the end our wishes for COP28 would be that the promises, funding promises not to be just on paper, black and white. We need to reach a commitment all together with indigenous people to create a realistic partnership, to have a holistic perspective, to better understand how we uh, function 
So how we work together, and not to only have a top-bottom perspective, but also to have a bottom-up perspective. We want to invite you to know our reality, to know our results, and also the impacts that the funds are making possible and we can implement in our territories. It's vital, it's very important, the process to acknowledge and to go deeper through dialogue, through listening processes. And we want you to see from our eyes how we are getting a better impact in our territories. This is what we wish for this future COP28, right? Not just words that go with the wind. No, we want practical and realistic things on the field, thanks to the support of donors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we're gonna move on to the Q&A. We have about 10, 13 minutes. Uh, take on a few of the questions already there. Again, if you have qu any questions, please use the Q&A box. And of course, if possible, please identify yourself and the organization uh, that you belong to. Now, the first question, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, Deborah, I think you might be the best person to answer, but. Um, you know, very open for others to come in as well. The first question actually is asking, is there a global database um, that uh, can show what type of funds that exist to date at various levels for the indigenous peoples and um, local community organizations? Um, Deborah, would you, would you have any idea? Uh, thank you, Tin. I know there is a lot of partners doing the mapping on the funds, but I don't know if there is a, dat a database, actually. Thanks, Deborah. Would uh, Casey, would, would you have um, any idea or other, uh, other um, speakers also any, any idea if such a database exists? No, a database doesn't exist, but there are, the Shandia platform is a umbrella in which all indigenous led funds are, are supposed to advocate for direct financing, as well as international funders for indigenous peoples is also creating its own coalition of funds globally, which I know Pudali is, is a part of. Okay. Um, and maybe Casey, since you're here, you could also take, uh, pick up the uh, the next question, which actually relates to private philanthropic donors. Is asking how can private philanthropic donors access these global, regional, and um, national indigenous-led funds? I'm assuming it is to support them. Um, how does yeah? How 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 does the Christiansen Fund do? And what advice do you have for other philanthropic donors? And maybe and, and Jenny, if you have any advice as well, please feel free to come in. Yeah, so the Christensen Fund puts all of our international grantees, including Indigenous-led funds, through a process called equivalency determination, which essentially makes them a U.S. charity for a number of years. And Budali's gone through this process. And the beautiful thing about that process, while it's complicated, then all other private donors, philanthropic donors, can access those organizations and those funds as if they were a U.S.-based charity. So that's the case of the Christensen Fund. Great. Thank you. Anyone wants to add anything or can we, shall we move on to the, <clears throat> the next question? Okay. Um, the next question is which organizations are best able to help indigenous peoples with mentoring and assisting in organizational development, financial management, uh, monitoring and reporting, project development, proposal development, and the development of advocacy and lobbying programs. So essentially, you know, which organizations are able to help um, Indigenous peoples with es essentially um, a lot of, I guess, capacity building on 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 running, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, these programs. Um, Deborah, Jenny, any thoughts? Uh, maybe I, I will say that will depends on, on each case. For example, as clarify, we are actually supporting uh, the, the network, the collaborations, uh, organizations with, with all these processes. But at the same time, we are also um, trying to, to make this exchange uh, where people from the ground can tell donors what are some of the things that are hard for them to to comply with and how we can actually change some of these uh, aspects for example we've been working in 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 southeast um africa with with the pastoralist communities and there 
uh, we have like, for example, not, not required on, on everything um, report, but we're going to do a gathering. So we have like an annual gathering with all the, the organizations came and they can say what they're learning from, from the process, what were the constraints and how we can move forward. So for example, if we have um, this exchange, then can, we can create some flexibility because I think I have to be a balance between creating capacity in the organization, but reacting to what is needed in, with the urgent matter right now in, in moving funds for, for that actions on the ground. Great, thanks so much, Deborah. Um, I'm just wondering if Josmara and Valeria have, you know, have any practical examples as well in terms of organizations that can help, um, yeah, indigenous populations with these issues and skills. I just like to comment uh, very briefly about this uh, issue. Something that we got after reflecting on our daily procedures, we were able to empower ourselves to be more flexible and to know how better exchange a different perspectives. We are together with uh, Josie Mara and she's working to detect uh, more community funds and we do it through uh, sharing experiences and from then on we are able to build our own processes through th these ideas and exchanges because at the end of the day we're experiencing on the basis, on an ongoing basis, and also we uh, ex uh, respect our processes, but also we uh, respect amongst everything our vision as indigenous people. Therefore, it's very difficult that uh, suddenly a specific organization or institution that we recommend uh, that with the exception if they are our partners that they know us uh, for a while. Uh, it's very important to say that our partners must know you very well and how this partner will contribute in a way that will always respect your rights, your self-determination uh, processes. This is in the end a vital issue to us. This exchange with these different stakeholders has been very uh realistic to better adapt our processes and to get adapted to these exchanges and the donors must know very well our realities and this will always help us to consolidate the funds in our territories in uh, brazil and the amazon region thank you well you know what i think that it is important to be aware about till what extent we can work together when we build together something else, when we are uh, working on this ongoing best basis to get new processes. We are always participating in technical opinions. Therefore, these uh, partnerships, they need to get adopted in this more autonomous way of acting of uh, indigenous people. On the other hand, it's also very important that donors to be aware about it and to investigate about the way we proceed. Our partners, the big NGOs, and all the intermediary, intermediaries are not the single ones that get the funds. Today, we can play a much more vital role than the one that we played in the past. Great, thank you. Um, I We're <clears throat> going to have to close in about six minutes, so we'll take one more question. Um, this one has actually two parts, so I'm going to ask um, all of our speakers to come in at some point. Um, but the first part is actually Valeria and Josimara. Um, it's, it's, it's directed towards you. Um, and the first part is what capacity do you have that enable you to access and manage funds directly um, from the donors? Um, and then the second part is for those who do not have that kind of capacity that Valeria and Josimara have, um, is it not necessary to support them first through so-called intermediaries, I guess, to build the capacity and then and eventually enable them to move away from these intermediaries so that they can get direct funding? Um, so for that second part, um, it would be great to hear, you know, brief thoughts from Deborah, Jenny and Casey. But first, Valeria and Josimara, um, what capacity um, do you have that allows you to access and manage funds directly? Oh my God, what a challenge. 
to give you a quick answer. Okay, let's try it. You know, we try to organize ourselves and we get a different structure to have these kind of activities. Podali, uh, with the action that is implemented in Brazilian Amazon Basin, in the end, Podali, it's a great tool that was created by indigenous people, but also by uh, indigenous stakeholders. Today, we do have our own instruments and our organizations are able to assess ourselves in order to pace the way forward, to show the way forward to better manage uh, resources that were given by this is already happening in Podali in Mato Grosso region was able to work with the Shabanti people was able to capture some resources and choose Podali to be the mechanism in such a way Podali offers the resources straightforward to the Shabanti people and this is a way, it's a very specific way. These are very concrete things. We want to become these qualified instrument and mechanisms at the service of our people and organizations. This could be the answer, the experience that we had with Podali. Thank you. Yes, as for another experience that we had in the indigenous fund in Rio Negro Basin, we have a very strong uh, indigenous movement, which is the FOINRI, which is the Federation of Indigenous Associations that belongs to Coyabi as well uh, in Brazil. And uh, our organizations are strengthening these capabilities. We are still consolidating our organizations and our organization and stakeholders offer new opportunities, opening new spaces for people to be more straightforward when uh, working with the funds in order to develop all the initiatives in our territories. Thus, our organizations are the main pillar. Great, thank you so much for 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 taking that on. Um, despite, like I said, a really difficult challenge of asking you to be brief in your answers, Deborah, uh, do you want to to <clears throat> take on the second part of the question? Uh, thank you. I, I will say that um, there is a natural allies and partners to the indigenous people's local community and Afro descendant in the ground. So and maybe we we can go and work um, directly with, with the people and then they can decide who is the natural ally or who is the person or the organization that they want to, to be the mentor and work with them to make their capacity. This this one important thing. And I think the other important thing is um, to re really uh, understand that the funds, the most of the funds goes directly to the, to the communities, right? So and they decide on how they're going to 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 actually spend these funds on the ground because sometimes for the capacity building side is a very limited uh, funding. And, and then, for example, in our case, um, we were we are the ones uh, taking, for example, the responsibility of writing the reports and, and giving that. So we don't pass that to some of our, our, our partners and some of our brothers and sisters in the ground. So I think uh, looking at these processes where, for example, from me to to, to my partners, uh, we can have a more flexible uh, way of sharing knowledge and reporting and all that, but that actually I as a, as a, as a fund gets the responsibility to, to write the report and do the other, the other things. That can be also a model that can be used, but I think the most important part is uh, letting the people on the ground to, to make the decisions on where, where, a how, and which which person or an organization they want to work with. Thank you, Deborah, <clears throat> Jenny, um, and then maybe after uh, Casey, we'll perhaps close with you. Um, any reflections or just to to, to touch on the the final uh, the second half of that question? Thank you. I really echo a lot of Deborah's points just now. I think the most some of the most exciting emerging models, um, such as the Tenny facility, are those where IP and LC led organizations can make their own proposals and make their own choices about how they would like to see the money spent and how they can be supported, but where there is still technical support available from organizations to help manage that and in a way that the IP and LC led organizations would like to have rather than that be imposed on them. And I think that really works 
from the points I made earlier from a bilateral organisation as well to mean that they are easily able to be funded because we're able to channel that funding through an organisation such as Tenure Facility. So it's a model um, such as that that I think we need to scale up where it really works for the donors in terms of the reporting, the administration, absorbing the risks, but it can also really work from the other side also in terms of that really proactive and um, really empowering model where it's the IPNLC led organisation to get to design how they would like to see the funds spent and they are the ones who are doing the implementation with technical support. So that's the kind of model I would really like to see scaled up. Great, thank you. Casey, final thoughts? No, I completely agree with Deborah and Jenny's points. I think it's about indigenous people's right to self-determination. Each case is different. Let the community decide who they want to work with and define direct finance. If the case is to work with Clarify or Tenure Facility and they think that's direct financing, that's absolutely their decision and a, and a great model. And in other cases, going directly to communities or funds like Pudali is also a great example. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we have run out of time, so we will have to close this webinar. Um, I would really like to thank the audience for staying with us and do apologize that we're not able to take all the questions. Um, and of course, I would like to thank all of our speakers, um, particularly, you know, Josimara and Valeria, who have joined us despite connectivity issues. We really appreciate you being able to stay for the whole hour as well. Um, can we give that all of our speakers, a virtual round of applause, please. Thank you so much for your insights. And of course, thank you to the audience as well for your participation. Now, if you're interested in taking a deeper dive into indigenous financing and issues at COP28, the tenure facility will be there and they are sharing a link where you can register for a couple of the hybrid events that they are organizing. Um, of course, thanks also to our hosts at the Fort Foundation, the Land Portal Foundation, the Tenure Facility, and the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Um, it's been a real pleasure for me to moderate this event. Um, and all the best with COP28. And I hope that, you know, all of what you hope for will come true and that we can, you know, next year this time when we have this conversation, um, it will be even more optimistic um, and positive than it has been. Thank you so much. Have a great day, afternoon, evening or night and goodbye.